on Nation and Nation. Police amass in the capital as pandemic protests hit day 20. What could Trudeau's controversial use of the Emergency Act mean, and what precedent could it set for policing Indigenous activism? If it gives more powers um, uh, to police and to security institutions to repress and suppress Indigenous-led movements to defend their land, then that, that could be a real concern. Plus, most Indigenous people now live in urban centres. How a new human rights clinic is helping Ottawa residents navigate the uglier side of city life. It puts them on the front line of, uh, of racism, which, which, as we might expect, tends to be more prevalent in larger centres. Welcome to Nation to Nation, I'm Brett Forster. Earlier this week, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau invoked the Federal Emergencies Act for the first time in its 34-year history. The law gives the feds sweeping powers to crack down on disruptive protests they say are linked to extremism and crime. We're talking about a group that is organized, agile, knowledgeable, and driven by an extremist ideology where might makes right. But not everyone is convinced it's necessary, and some wonder what precedent the Liberal government is setting. For more, I'm joined by Andrew Crosby. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton, who studies security, policing, and intelligence. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. First, do you think these protests really require the declaration of a national, quote-unquote, public order emergency? Yeah, well, we've seen uh, over the course of the uh, these freedom, the so-called freedom convoy protests over the last uh, three weeks in Ottawa and, and propping up in other locations, uh, we've seen various um, orders uh, implemented and passed to try to attempt to 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 deal with these uh, with these protests. You know, we saw the city of Ottawa pass a uh, declare state of emergency. We saw the Ontario government also pass a similar uh, type of emergency order. Now we see the federal government passing an emergency order. Um, so, I mean, it depends on who you ask. There's, uh, there's uh, diverging opinions on whether this is necessary or not. Um, I think those that argue that it is say that this gives kind of the feds, gives them control over the situation, gives them some more tools and more punitive measures to deal with it. Uh, and then others, other groups like the Canadian Civil Liberties Association say that it doesn't meet the, th the threshold that, um, um, you know, uh, there exists, already exist tools to deal with this uh, kind of public order events such as existing policing tools. So it depends who you ask, but um, it uh, it seems like it is a bit of an overreach and could set a could set a precedent for the future for sure. Well, that was going to be my follow up question. What type of precedent do you think the Liberals are setting by uh, invoking this act? Yeah, well, it is uh, it is the first time that it's being used uh, um, since it, since the it was kind of switched over from the War Measures Act in the in the, in the late nineteen eighty. So uh, it, it is precedent setting. Um, and like I said, you have varying levels of support for it, um, you know, but over the last, um, well, I guess, yeah, since, since the, the eighties, uh, before and, and after, you know, we've protests are not new, um, and public order and disorder events are not new to society and Canadian society. And, uh, we have over the years, over the recent decades, many different types of protests, large disruptive protests. Um, with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in some cases when the numbers get up that high in urban environments um, and uh, more rural environments as well. Um, but what we have here by invoking this, um, you know, uh, protests, um, social uh, issues and causes kind of evolve, different protests pop up at different times. And um, if we have... Uh, this being this emergency legislation kind of being uh, invoked, um, it may it may um, be used more readily in, in the future to deal with uh, with future protests. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, jump in there. How concerned are you about a possible chilling effect on indigenous led activism? You know, blockades, occupations and crowdfunding are common tactics of indigenous led direct action. 
Indeed, you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, since uh, the 1960s and 1970s into the 80s and beyond, uh, you know, Indigenous-led uh, movements and activism uh, communities have, you know, have led these kind of high-profile uh, uh, kind of movements and protests. Uh, less so uh, kind of in the protest realm and more so, I would say, in the, in the realm of land defense and defending um, indigenous lands against encroachment, against resource extraction and things like that. So, you know, um, in the 1980s, uh, we really saw the, the use of the blockade tactic uh, come to the fore and being, being used kind of all the time as a, as a particular tool um, to block access to uh, indigenous land, to, to, to ultimately disputed land, land that may be claimed by the provinces or or the federal government or uh, companies, resource companies, uh, but where, you know, that may, that may be um, not ceded or treated and, and, and indigenous nations and communities live on this land. So the blockade has been kind of a tactic we've seen used over and over again up until the present day. Um, so, you know, and maybe we can get into this more later, but a big kind of... Um, a secure, some security terminology coming into it is around this idea of critical infrastructure. Um, so when, you know, when, block, when ro roads are blockaded or rail lines are blockaded or borders are blockaded, we see this invocation of, of critical infrastructure protection and securitization. Um, so I don't know if it'll have a chilling effect when, when you're talking about land um, as the root of most conflicts. Um, I don't think this is going to deter Indigenous communities from defending their land. Uh, but if it gives more powers um, uh, to police and to security institutions to repress and suppress Indigenous-led movements to defend their land, then that, that could be a real concern for the future. Mm -hmm. I suppose only time will tell, uh, but I would like to switch gears as you just suggested. Uh, we've all seen videos over the last couple weeks of security, uh, police and other personnel kind of supporting this movement and protest. Why do you think that is? There exists some kind of some political, cultural uh, synergies or affinities between, um, you know, conservative or far right uh, types of uh, uh, groups or people and security institutions like the military and police. So, um, um, some research has shown that, you know, these uh, ideological or political affinities um, can be shared between um, these groups and these institutions. Um, other sociological research on protest policing looks at, you know, the idea of police conservatives, conservatism. So, you know, policing institutions are inherently conservatives, conservative and they kind of reflect um, those values in, in their um, in the way that they, uh, you know, police and their and uh, and the business of policing. Um, so, you know, I I would also couch this in terms of an historical approach. Maybe not getting into detailed historical um, picture here, um, but the way I look at um, you know, how these institutions have evolved, um, really in tandem with how the Canadian state has evolved. Uh, so we look at the kind of history, the foundation of this country um, and the role of the military and police in kind of establishing control over this country, um, you know, which included um, suppressing Indigenous sovereignty, um, helping remove Indigenous peoples from their land so that settlers could settle on the land. And then looking, of course, at, you know, municipal police forces, if we want to look you know, away from the RCMP and the military, more to like municipal police forces, how they were originally founded in Ottawa as well. Um, you know, around kind of maintaining order, um, um, you know, policing kind of uh, policing communities that, you know, um, working class communities and lower income and marginalized communities. There's a, there's a specific... Mm -hmm history there. There's a, there's a colonial um, history there too, right? That uh, kind of needs to be acknowledged yeah. that makes it's a little bit different. Uh, but I do want to follow up uh, on something you said. In your research, you obtained internal files from the military's counterintelligence unit that said, uh, quote, far-right groups will always attract active and former military personnel due to their conservative values and paramilitary trainings. Is that issue being taken seriously enough, both within that institution and perhaps externally among the civilian authorities? 
Yeah, I think uh, I think that research kind of shows uh, um, you know an admission here that um, kind of what we're talking about and what some of the kind of research shows the, the military is very aware uh, of kind of the um, its inherent values and the people that it attracts. Um, you know, so we see uh, you know as you said um, it, their own reports saying that uh, you know. Uh, conservative values and mil- paramilitary trainings kind of attract kind of individuals from the far right and the Canadian military and the CFNCIU, the counterintelligence unit, um, have been monitoring this over the last few years. More specifically, um, while security institutions like the military and others have been more concerned with indigenous protest or environmental protest or left-wing protest over the last 20 years. It's only in the last five years that they really kind of turned toward, okay, right-wing extremism uh, uh, is an issue that we should look at and it's within our ranks. So they, you know, um, uh, compiled a number of reports and to see how much, how many um, members of far-right groups are within their ranks. And we really see this coming to the fore in the, in these uh, freedom convoy protests where there's lots of reporting of police and military active and uh, former members being involved in organizing and um, participating in these protests. Finally, the Emergencies Act requires the feds to order an inquiry after invoking it. There are certainly already a number of questions being raised. What are some key issues you'd like to see that probe tackle? Maybe that's one of the, the few positive things that will come out of invoking uh, this, this, the Emergencies Act. It forces a public inquiry. Um, so I think what we see on the ground, what residents have been have really expressed as a source of frustration is how this entire, um, entire uh, issue and the event has been handled by the authorities and by police. So, so certainly within you know, the city of Ottawa and the, and the region here, um, there's, you know, there's been talk of systemic failures of the Ottawa police. Um, that's, uh, that people in this city have not, you know, it's not new. There's, there's been problems with the police, um, the, the institution of the Ottawa police service for, for many years, this is bringing a lot of things to the fore. It's really showing kind of a, uh, kind of a massive debacle that, uh, kind of in, is inflicting this institution. So, um, that may be one thing that comes out of the inquiry is uh, what went on with the policing here. We, we know that, you know, just kind of maybe circle back a bit um, to the policing of protest and the control of space uh, over the last 20, 30 years and really large demonstrations in this country around mega events and student strikes and Olympics. We, we see police, you know, have a lot of tools for spatial containment and controlling space and moving in um, with a specific posture against, uh, uh, against you know, uh, more left-wing side movements. And this, we see something completely different. So maybe we'll get some answers there. All right, we have to leave it there. Uh, Mr. Crosby, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Anytime. And after a short break, how a local friendship center is leading the charge against racism in the city. Stick around. Welcome back. The local friendship center here in Ottawa administers a lot of programs and services. One in particular recently celebrated its one-year anniversary, and that's the Indigenous Human Rights Program. It's described as a place where someone can get free legal advice when their rights are violated. For more, we're joined by Morris Switzer. He's a member of the Indigenous Reconciliation Working Group of the Ontario Human Rights Commission and the Executive Director of the Odawa Friendship Centre, Randy Mays. Welcome to Nation and Nation. Well, thanks, Brad. Thank you. Good morning. It's uh, nice to be here. Uh, Mr. Switzer, let me begin uh, with you. So what is an Indigenous human right and how is it different than a non-Indigenous human right? Uh, it, it, we, we need to go back a bit to understand, and most Canadians aren't aware, that, that um, the overwhelming majority of First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples um, live in urban centres. In, in Ontario, that, that figure is, is about 85%. 
and many First Nations people historically, of course, have, have left the, um, the reserves uh, for opportunities that weren't available uh, to them at home, uh, education, employment, health care, other services. And, uh, and that, that uh, migration uh, has, has actually it, it's had some very positive uh, outcomes for many uh, First Nations uh, and Métis and Inuit uh, peoples, but, but it also comes with, with some drawbacks. And one of them is that it puts them on the front line of, uh, of racism, which, which, as we might expect, tends to be more prevalent in larger centers. So um, uh, things that many Canadians take for granted, uh, um, renting apartments without uh, any hassle, um, going shopping without having someone follow them around in a store, um, getting service from uh, uh, police officers or, or even medical service uh, practitioners um, with, um, without any, uh, any rudeness or, or disparagement. Those are things that, unfortunately, Indigenous peoples and, and other racialized communities can't take for granted. And we've had many national commissions of inquiry, uh, you know, related to that. So, so a, a partnership um, began between uh, the Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centres in 2019, and um, the largest uh, organization providing uh, free legal advice, uh, uh, you know, to clients, and that's called the. It's a it's a law students association called the Pro Bono Students of Canada, and they are uh, that that uh, organization exists at 22 law schools across mm -hmm. the country. So this this Ontario partnership began to start addressing those those challenges. That, yes, that if I if I may jump in there, I, I apologize for interrupting you, but uh, you know you, you you made a lot of interesting points there. You you laid out some of the things that people can kind of uh, go to this program for, whether you're being followed around in a store or something like that. So what's kind of the chief goal here? What can it really do for people who need to use it, uh, Mr. Switzer? Well, it, it certainly it, it gives um, urban First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples um, a, a greater sense of security. Uh, again, things that most uh, Canadians can take for granted, um, and it does so in a in a cultural uh, uh, setting where they where they feel more comfortable talking about these issues. Like at places like friendship centers, there are 29 friendship centers in Ontario, including. The Odawa Center, where where Randy uh, is the executive director, and and these, as you understand, Brett, uh, there is a great mistrust of mainstream institutions by Indigenous peoples, and and uh, so to have these uh, opportunities to discuss uh, challenges in a, a culturally appropriate setting, like a friendship center, is is uh, it's it's really a plus. Uh, Mr. Mays, over to you. Why do you th why do this program out of the Adawa Friendship Center, and what's it been like so far? Uh, well, I think it's really important, uh, you know, that the services are provided uh, through Adawa, and uh, it's been a, a really great experience uh, working with uh, the pro bono students uh, and uh, OFIFC, you know, with this endeavor. And it gives uh, our community members, uh, you know, an opportunity to feel comfortable uh, uh, you know, coming through the center, uh, you know, because there is that cultural aspect. And, uh, you know, I, I know, unfortunately, you know, with COVID, we haven't been able to, to hold them uh, in person. So, you know, they have been held virtually. But, uh, you know, now as things are opening back up, you know, it's our goal to eventually, you know, uh, host uh, in-person uh, uh, sessions with, with the lawyer, uh, you know, for, for one hour uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mays, I'm interested to ask, what do you imagine as the future for a program like this? Do you think it could have national appeal and maybe spread to other friendship centers throughout the country? I think it's really important, you know, because human rights is, you know, a, a national scope. It's not only regional. And, uh, you know, the more that this program is out there providing, uh, you know, the free services to our community members, you know, to help them navigate through, you know, the legalities uh, of human rights complaints or uh, potential, potential of, you know, 
any discomfort in that area in their jobs uh, out in the public and uh, you know it gives them a, a, a comfortable place to come to and uh, you know I know there's going to be another uh, uh, location in, coming up in 22 with the Thunder Bay uh, Indian Friendship Center as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Switzer, what happens if a client's needs go beyond the free advice that they may get at the program, uh, criminal matters for example? Well, um, that's one of the roles that the the student lawyers and the, the student uh, lawyers are, are mentored by by uh, uh, practicing uh, lawyers, I should add. They're not left to their own devices. And um, uh, and that uh, that initial discussion can determine if they have a, 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 a situation that requires uh, further action, whether it's by the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal or or, or through criminal courts, that, that that's a piece of advice that they, that they get through their initial consultations. And uh, I, I want to add, this: it's more than a, a, a justice initiative. It's an educational initiative because a number of these lawyers that are involved, the law students, are are Indigenous. Um, and as well, uh, all of the participating law students in the programs, uh, this first year at, at uh, Odawa, there are about uh, 28, I believe. They all are undergo cross-cultural Indigenous um, learning, training, uh, through the Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centres. So it, it's, a, it's a wonderful educational um, um, practice as well. And Mr. Mays, I'd like to give the last word over to you. How well has the program been received by the community? Has it been getting a lot of uptake so far? Uh, well, over the last year, uh, we've had uh, 160 of our community members access the services and, uh, you know, we continue to promote it uh, through, you know, social media, uh, you know, to encourage uh, anyone, you know, that's interested in accessing the service, you know, and it's not only for people who are affected by it, but, you know, those individuals who want to actually learn about, you know, the human rights aspect, uh, you know, uh, we could have uh, coordinators from, uh, you know, other organizations, you know, uh, you know, participating and, and calling for a session so they're aware, uh, so they can uh, promote that to their clients as well if they come across anyone, uh, you know, who they feel uh, whose human rights have been infringed upon and, uh, you know, they can recommend that they contact, you know, the human rights clinic. All right, uh, unfortunately we're out of time for this segment, but I do want to thank both of you for coming on Nation to Nation. Thank you, Brad. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, we have to take another break. We'll be back with more on Nation to Nation in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight's show. The House of Commons is off next week, but we'll still have plenty of coverage for you from Ottawa. If you missed any part of tonight's show, you can check out our podcast, as always, at aptnnews.ca slash podcast. I'm Brett Forrester. Thanks for watching, and have a great evening.